as it is sovereign God who rules over all the nations as scripture teaches and that God will bless nations under certain situations and circumstances. And we have promise after promise in the scriptures. There's validation after validation in history of God's blessing upon nations and when nations refuse to let God be God in their midst. So I really thought it was a prime time and an opportunity even in praying for the last several weeks of what I'd be moving towards and preaching as we get into this summer season. I really felt like this is where we need to be in the book of Nehemiah. If you've never read Nehemiah, I want to encourage you to take some time in it this, this week and even in the weeks to come and look and see what the Bible has to say. There's an undertaking that takes place in the book of Nehemiah where God chooses a man and does a, uh, an incredible work a wall that had been ruined, it's, 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 it's completely destroyed, and others had attempted to do what Nehemiah did, and over years and years and decades even never accomplished what he accomplished in a matter of 50 days and a little over a month and a half. So I think it's a great place to go as we look at the importance of leadership and what's needed. This is an election year in our country. Uh, this is that time of year we start selecting leaders, national leaders, state leaders, local leaders. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about leadership, all right? Because uh, more than Democrat or more than Republican, more than all those things combined together, I'm a believer first and foremost. And that, that's, that's the primary thing that drives me in a voting booth. It should be the very primary thing that drives us as fathers, as husbands, or if, you're, if you're a wife, a spouse. Those are the things that drive your life. Those are the things by which we set our moral compass by. What does the Bible say? And that's how we vote. That's how we live our lives. That's how we move in the world we're around us. And that's where God wants us to be, that he, first and foremost, is our first consideration and our loyalties lie with the word of God and with the truth of the word of God. There's a passage we mentioned. There's a lot of passages in Scripture that talk about how God blesses a nation. But there's one in particular in Proverbs 28 that says this, a nation will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leaders. Another translation that says uh, that uh, uh, with honest, sensible leaders, there's stability. New American Standard says that, that by the transgression of land, many are its princes, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, that nation endures. Living Bible says with honest, sensible leaders, there's stability. I know that uh, kind of tongue in cheek matter here, but with politics, sometimes it's hard to get honest to you, amen? But, uh, so, but what the Bible says, the leaders that make a difference are the ones that are honest and the ones that are sensible. Where does honesty and where does sensibility play into, into leadership? Well, those are the things we're going to talk about today. But when you have those kind of leaders, with those kind of leaders also comes what the Bible says here is a strong nation, an enduring nation. But I, I, I think you can kind of circle those two words and honestly say, hey, that's the kind of nation... We want our nation to be. We want to be a strong nation, and we want to be an enduring nation. God says a lot of that depends on where your leaders take you and what kind of leaders you have. And we're going to look at some things today as we start an introduction into the book of Nehemiah about leaders and the, how, the importance of leaders. But whatever we say here today in, in regard to leadership and talking about national leadership also applies to your home. It applies to your own life. It applies to your own personal well-being. When there's a strong leader in your life, when obviously the Lord Jesus is, is the strongest leader of all, but when we're the leaders that he desires us to be, then there can be endurance and then there can be strength. So as we get into this book of Nehemiah, as I say, we'll talk about this for weeks to come. But I, I want to kind of lay out some groundwork today and talk about leadership because when leadership is failing and when leadership is lacking, then, you know, everything else falls apart. As the leadership goes in a nation, so goes that nation according to biblical principles. We wonder where we, we've drifted over the last decades that we've seen. I think there's been a real lack of integrity within leadership, the biblical integrity, not the, what man calls integrity, but real biblical, honest integrity. I want to give you this morning as we introduce the book of Nehemiah, the importance of leadership and what we might call principles of leadership. And it's really just, it, 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 as we look at these six things it's, it, it, as an introduction, uh, we're going to look at just the importance of what, what really is, you know, uh, what makes up a leader and how that leader operates. And with the book of Nehemiah, you can see him in moving against all the impossibilities. You can see him moving against criticism. You see him dealing with all the things that one has to deal with in the course of leading anything, whether it's a, whether it's a father and a mother in their family or a, a husband in his home or on a job or in government offices, as in a church and leading in a church. All these principles apply. And one thing you'll notice in Scripture, if you're a Christian, that God has called you to be salt and light. You know what that means in a nutshell? God's called you to be a leader. 
It means that you take the front. It means you stand up. It means that you're noticed. It means that you're recognized. And you have something you stand for and you stand with. So we'll look at that. But let me just lay out these six principles. And then I'll give you a brief introduction to Nehemiah itself and the book. And then for the next several weeks, we'll get, we'll get much, much deeper into what we're talking about here. But these principles of leadership are things that we'll look at. One, nothing happens until someone provides leadership for it. Mark it down. Nothing happens in a nation. Nothing happens in a state. Nothing really happens in your home until someone provides leadership for it. If no one provides leadership, then hey, look at history. It tells us everything falls apart. We're dealing with a lot of race issues right now in our culture. Look back to the 60s when, when it was an extreme difficult time in our nation. Guess what? Someone stood up and took leadership by the name of Martin Luther King. He took leadership and things began to happen because someone stood in a gap that needed to be filled and he filled it. I mean, this is, this is on down and even in business you see this, folks. I mean, when the fast food industry started, it really started with a little place called McDonald's. I mean, the guy was named Ray Kroc who came along and Ray Kroc said, you know, I want a fast food at a convenient price and in a, in a clean atmosphere. He invented an entire industry today which has followed suit just by providing leadership. But again, when leadership fails, things just don't happen. Look at your own life. There's been times that your life has been changed and influenced by people who were in leadership that made a difference in your life and their leadership meant something in your life. But that goes on from that place to your own life. Will you be a leader where you are? And there's really no, there, there, there's no limitations here. God wants us all to be leaders in, in one form or, or another. Most problems in a culture, most problems in a home, most problems in, in a nation can usually be traced back to a lack of competent leadership. The greatest need, according to what the Bible teaches us, is for people, Christians to be, the salt and the light in their generations. Provide leadership is what that's saying. Provide leadership in the areas that need leadership. And if there's no leadership or if the leadership is not honest and upright, then things do not happen. I know that you're looking at the, the prophet Samuel in our list studies, but in the book of Judges, you know, if you read the book of Judges, it goes through uh, these, these cycles. In fact, if you count them, there's seven cycles in the book of Judges where things are good and prosperous and then things deteriorate. Things are good and prosperous and then things deteriorate. Things are, it's, it's just an up and down cycle that happens. And the reason why, according to Judges, it says this way, every man did what was right in his own eyes because there was no king in Israel, because there's no leadership. No providing good, strong leadership. And when there's no leadership, guess what? People do their own thing. Let's refer back to the first verse I shared. When, when the transgressions of a nation are many, there are many princes. What's that mean? There's a lot of people who take leadership, but they're not really leaders. They have leader on their name. They put prince, king, you know, congressman, president, mayor, whatever you might want to title it. But are they providing leadership that needs to be provided? So we understand first and foremost that nothing happens until true leadership provides, is, is, is providing the leadership that is needed. The second principle we'll look at is this. Leadership, in a nutshell, is influence. I mean, if you really had to summarize what leadership is, the simplest, purest form, the wor simplest word for it, I believe, for good or for bad, it is the word influence. And Paul writes, Timothy tells him, hey, you need to be an influencer. And don't, don't be concerned about your age Age is not important here. Leadership is important. He said, you know, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the believer. And he talked about how you're an example in purity, in love, in faith, your conduct, all of these things. You provide leadership and you show an example of what real living and real life is. In other words, simply put, anytime you influence somebody, and it could be good or bad, anytime you influence people, you become a leader. And let me add to that. We're all influencers. And by failing to be the kind of leadership that God calls us to be, then we're not influencing for righteousness. It's a negative influence. You're a leader. Young people, you're a leader at school. On your job, people, you're a leader. In your office, you say, well, I'm not the boss. It doesn't matter, but are you a leader? Because if you're a leader, by definition, you're the person who influences. Let, let me give you even a, a deeper definition for what we'd call just biblical leadership. And I don't remember where I got this, but it's so good I had to write it down. A leader is someone with God-given ability and responsibility to influence a group of God's people to accomplish God's purpose for that group. Now, isn't that a good definition for what true leadership is? A leader is someone with God-given abilities and responsibility to influence a group of God's people to accomplish God's purpose for that group. 
Now, that's, that's, the, that's the role of parents. That's the role of husband. That's the role, that, that should be the role of, of employee as well as employer. We're there to make a difference. We're there to be the righteous influence. If, if you talk about the definitions of salt and light, when Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, those are two obvious elements that do what? They influence. Light dispels the darkness. Salt changes the, the circumstances. It changes the environment. So we make a difference. Anytime we make a difference, anytime we're influencing, then we're assuming this role of leadership. Now, if you're looking for biblical roles, there's a lot of them, but I think one of the great roles of leadership is Nehemiah and looking at the book of Nehemiah because you see here a man who comes in and does what nobody else has done. And it's not that necessarily God hadn't raised up others to do it at different times. They just hadn't completed it and they hadn't been successful at doing it, but he does it against all odds. In fact, what others had tried for years and years and years to do, I reiterate, he did in 50 days. It was a miraculous accomplishment. Second, leadership is influence. Third principle we'll look at, the test of leadership is what? Is anybody following? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They listen, I know them, and they follow me. You can tell that Jesus is Lord and leader. Why? There's all billions of people who followed him. There's a lot of people. Paul, the apostle, when writing the church, he said, listen, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So if you want to be the righteous kind of leader and the right kind of leader, then you have an example that's already been laid down for you. There's the example that's said about what genuine leadership really is. It's found in Jesus Christ. So Paul's saying, hey, follow me because hey, I'm following Jesus. That's what every leader of any lift group or any Bible study or any church or any ministry ought to be able to turn around, whether it's a children's ministry or a youth group, say, see, I'm living my life. This is the way you're supposed to live your life because I'm following the way Jesus lived his life. Follow me. That's leadership. We all, I think we all need human models, but we need to make sure our human models are followers of Jesus and that they're following the Lord Jesus Christ. John Maxwell, who now who was a pastor for many, many years, uh, of a church in California has since gone into secular uh, leadership training programs. But, you know, he made this little, what he called the parable of leadership. He says, he who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one followeth him is only taking a walk. <laughs> That'll true of a lot of people today. They, they'd fail to influence anybody. What you understand about leadership and what we'll see, especially as we look at Nehemiah's life, it really hasn't got anything to do with your position or your title. A lot of people with positions and a lot of people have titles, but they really don't do a lot of influencing. I mean, this is a mistake that a lot of big bureaucracies like government have a tendency to make, even big corporations. They give titles out to people and they think because they give this person a title and now they're this or they're that, then those people who now have assumed this title are automatically going to make a big difference. That's not necessarily true at all. You, you guys in the military have seen that some, haven't you? Amen. <laughs> You've seen somebody with a title. You shouldn't have had that title. There's no influence at all. They're not making any big difference. There's a lot of people who've been delegated authority, but they really don't influence people in the right direction. They, they, they may be called leaders, but they don't exercise real leadership. I've been in churches like this. So a lot of people have a title of an elder or a deacon or a pastor or whatever it might be, and they're, they're just there and they hold the title and they're proud of their title, but they don't do nothing. They don't make any big difference. In fact, if you have to tell people and remind people that you're the boss or you're the leader or you're the head of the house and constantly reminding them of that, that's probably a pretty good fact you're not really leading anybody. You don't have to remind people when you're a genuine leader. They see the difference. They look up to you and they see there's somebody I want to be like. There's somebody that's influencing my life. It's true in my home as well as in the church. That's why the Bible talks about if you can't influence people in your own house, you shouldn't be trying to influence the house of God. It's just not going to make any difference. You know, uh, listen, if, if, you have to, if you're the kind of guy who has to get up and remind his wife all the time that you're the head of the home, you're probably not. You know, you've, you've probably lost it somewhere across the line. In fact, if that's what you're constantly doing, that's a pretty weak position to try to influence people from or try to motivate people from. Watch who I am, bless God, you know. Eh, it's not working, is it? The fourth principle of leadership we'll look in this series is leadership is character, it's not charisma. There's a lot of people with charisma. There's a lot of TV evangelists we've seen over the years with charisma, but we've also seen a lot of those guys go up and smoke. And why did, why did it happen? Why did everything fall apart? Why did everything deteriorate? Where are they today? Hey, the problem is they may have had charisma, but they didn't have character. You, you have to have character. 
it lends credibility to the leadership. It gets influence. If you don't have credibility, nobody's going to follow for long. If all you have is some kind of personality, reputation, well, reputation really gets down to what people say you are. That's why I'm so sick and so much with, with all the politics of our culture and our generation today that it's all about let's, let's be politically correct and let's say it just right so that I look good. Because my reputation is at stake here, so let's do everything. Let's have our little meeting. Let's don't provide any real solid direction because somebody might take that wrong and might see it in the wrong sight. So let's just, let's, and they're so concerned about the reputation, they should be more concerned about what the character is. Because reputation is what people say about you. Character is what you really are. I love what D.L. Moody said, and you've probably heard this statement before. Character is what you are in the dark when nobody's looking. Amen. If you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, you don't have to go there today. You might check, take a look at it. Paul lays out to Timothy the character of people who should be in leadership in the body of Christ, whether it's an overseer, elder, deacon. He talks about their, the issues of their, their, not their personality, not their degrees. He, there's nowhere and he says they have to have a seminary degree. But in all those verses, he does talk about integrity where they are in their life, where they are in their family, where they are in their home. Leadership is not based on the academics you have. It's not even the education you have. Leadership is based on character. If you follow true leaders of past, the true, true leaders are people who had some standards and character in their life. If you look at Nehemiah, as we're going to do in the days to come, you're going to see a man who is very, just as far as a, a person, he's just an ordinary type of person. But this ordinary type of person did extraordinary things. Why? Because he had depth of integrity and he had character in his life. In fact, I really believe as we've seen in even contemporary history reveal that usually, you know, you burn out real quick if you're just trying to, you know, act like you have character and not really have character. In fact, even you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at leadership models, when you look at somebody's leadership model, and as we should look for righteous leaders and people who have character and integrity in life, you, you don't seek to imitate them even. All right? I remember even as a young preacher, you know, I had some, some heroes of the faith that I wanted to preach like, you know. And so I'd try to preach like them, and I'd always just burn out real quick and fall apart and fizzle, and it just never worked. Until God began to say, it's not that I want you to be, take on their personality. I want you to, I want you to emulate their character. You know, and see that there's, there's, a, there's standards as they live by. That's when you become. I mean, God uses all types of personalities. I mean, you look to the Bible and you see probably, you know, Paul and Peter were exact opposites in personality. I mean, Abraham, Moses, they're all different kind of personalities in the scripture. And we're all different kind of personalities in this room. But God works on that deeper element in our life beyond our personality. And he works in bringing us to a place of integrity in our lives. What do great leaders have in common? They have character in common. They have integrity in common. Those are the things that are important. Look at Hebrews 13. It's, it makes this statement. Remember your leaders. Don't say, you know, he said, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. What? Remember those leaders. They spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith. God gives us three characteristics that are important to leadership. One, one they have a message worth remembering. Remember what they said? Remember what the message was? True leaders have a message. That's what inspires people. That's what gives people vision. That's what gives people a heart for direction. There's something they have said that is worth saying. And not only is it worth saying, it's worth remembering. It's worth repeating. They have a lifestyle worth considering. He said, look at these guys who've led you. Not only do they speak the word of God, look at the way they've lived their life. The way they live their life is important. Now, I know that we're living, and I think for the last 25, 30 years, almost every election cycle that's come around, whether it's been the four-year election cycle or the two-year election cycle, it's always been the same thing. Well, you know, is character really important? Well, according to the Bible, it is important. It's preeminent when choosing leaders and voting and voting booths. We look at this issue, is there this point of genuine character in their life? Are they people with a message? Are they people with a lifestyle? He says, then I want you to do and imitate their faith. That's powerful words, is it not? Imitate what? Imitate, what's their faith? Their faith is their, their life for Jesus Christ. Their influence for the kingdom of God. That's what you want to be like. So we understand that, in, that, that leadership is influence and therefore we're influencing other people. But the, the fifth principle of the six is this. Leadership can be learned. A lot of people believe, you know, well, great leaders are born. I don't, I don't believe that's the truth. 
All right? I believe that great leaders are people who've learned to be great leaders. They've been disciples. They've made hard choices. They've made right decisions, even when it didn't seem comfortable, even when it went sacrifice. They made the right choices. Philippians, Paul writes to the church of Philippians, and he says this, whatever you've learned, you know how to circle that, whatever you learn or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. He said, listen, I've lived this model because I've followed Jesus Christ. Now, you can follow me because I've followed him. You know, he's responded to the situations. He's responded to the circumstances. He's responded to the threats. He's responded to, 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 to the, the issues that were facing before him, and he did it in a righteous way. He says, this is the way we live our lives. This is the way we conduct our affairs. I mean, you can take two people in exact opposite situations. One of them will end up being a leader. The other washes out. What made the difference? Because the choices they made. Because of the choices they made. Did they make righteous choice? Jesus spent his ministry, his earthly ministry, training leaders. He had a public ministry where thousands upon thousands of people would gather and hear him preach. They'd see the miracles. They'd hear his teachings. But then he had that private ministry that involved the training of disciples. The training of men to be godly men and to be leaders. And even in that circle of 12, he had even a deeper inner circle of Peter and James and John. They were with him at the garden. They were with him at the Mount of Transfiguration. It seemed that they got the extra attention. In fact, even in the book of Galatians, Paul said Peter and James and John were the pillars of the church. They were leaders whom Jesus spent a committed time to develop and so that he revealed his heart, his integrity, his life to them and those men emulated the faith in Jesus Christ. It can be learned. I believe anybody in this room can be a great leader if we're willing to be disciplined, if we're willing to have character, if we're willing to make the hard choices, if we're willing to do what's right, if we're willing to consider things more than just our own comfort. The sixth and the last thing of these principles that we're introducing with will be this one, leadership. The moment you stop learning, you stop leading. Say, so what do you mean? It's important, and I share this with my staff. We talk about it at staff retreats. We talk about it in meetings. It's important that we're always growing. We never get to a place where we're just stagnant. When we get stagnant, those we lead start becoming stagnant. We have to stop growing, to, to, to continue growing and stop just being stagnant in our life. We have to always be learning. We always have to be developing. We always have to be growing. The Bible tells us, grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a consistent thing. I, I can't say, hey, I've been doing this for 42 years now. I've grown enough. I've known enough. So that's good. I can coach now. No, there's no place for that in your life. You never get to that, that point in that place. You're always learning. You're always growing. I'm always asking, them, where are you headed? What are you doing? What books are you reading? What, what's, what are you studying the Bible? I want, I want our staff growing. I want our church growing. I want our leaders growing. I, I want our lift leaders growing. We don't want to just pick up books and kind of coast through it all. You've got to learn what, what needs to be learned so you can teach and influence others to be what God's called them to be. There's this passage in Ecclesiastes. It says this, if an ax is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. What's that saying? Well, for a common vernacular, work smart, not hard. <laughs> work smarter, not harder. What's he saying here? You can take your ax and you can go chop down trees all day long. You're not going to get many trees chopped down if your ax is dull. Right? I mean, that's the simplicity of it. If the ax is dull... You don't sharpen the edge, you exert more strength. Wisdom has an advantage. There's another translation to put it this way. If the axe is dull and its edge is unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. What's the skill? I'm smart enough to know I need to sharpen my axe. Well, that's not real smart. That's real smart if you're chopping trees down. Amen? Amen. Well, what about chopping the trees of everyday world problems and issues? Hey, we've got to continue learning. There are no know-it-alls that make successful leaders. It just doesn't happen that way. And anytime we quit opening our heart and our mind to what God's saying to us, then we're in trouble. Now, let me just, those are six principles that I want to lay down because we're dealing with issues of leadership. 
Do you want to be the kind of man, the kind of woman, the kind of young person God wants you to be? And God wants you to be a leader. There's no place for a spiritual wallflower, all right? There's no place you sit back, I don't want to do that. I don't want the responsibility. God's called you to that. It's his will that you be that light and salt in the world. Let me give you a little background now of the story of Nehemiah, all right? In 586 B.C., this is B.C., not A.D., this is before Christ, you know, Five centuries before the Lord, almost six centuries before the Lord comes, fulfills the prophecies of his first coming. Israel is destroyed. It's ruined. The city is destroyed. Israel is scattered. The nation itself is deported for the most part. The strongest leaders and the best of the, uh, uh, of the best are taken to Babylon, which would be today's modern day Iraq and, and uh, Iran. And there they're kept for 70 years of captivity. Now, the prophet had told them this would take place. Prophets stood, not just one, two, three, four prophets said, listen, unless you repent, you're going to be carried in to captivity. And they very, very clear, you're going to experience 70 years of captivity. Well, they didn't learn the lesson. They didn't listen to the godly leaders. And they ended up in bondage to the Babylonians, to the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, some time goes by. We get about 50 years down the road, all right? The first group of Jews is now allowed to return. All right, so they're heading back. In 516, while they're there, they rebuild the temple that was in Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. If you go back, you remember it was under Belshazzar the king that the temple was destroyed. He had the vision and all those things, you know. Uh, that, I mean, not the, the handwriting on the wall. Daniel told him what the handwriting on the wall was about, that, hey, judgment was at the door. There's nothing you can do about it. You send away the opportunity you had to be great. You've blown it. All right? Well, that night, it says that the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire came in and took the city. It was an invincible city, but not to God, all right? They had these great walls. In fact, there were dual walls that surrounded it. You know, it said the, the outer wall was like wide enough for six chariots to ride around the city abreast of each other. It's a massive wall with guard tires everywhere. Belshazzar, in the meantime, was having a big drunken party. Everybody was invited. All his leaders were there. Everybody was celebrating. Belshazzar the king, they were drinking wine, blaspheming God, and using the sacred vessels from the temple to party with. That night, the Medes and the Persians took that city just according to what Daniel said would happen. Within 24 hours, it was all over for Belshazzar. The Medes and the Persians had gone and blocked the Euphrates River in the, in the night, had dammed the river up. Great military strategy came under the city walls where the river flowed in and took it. It was destroyed. And meanwhile, Jerusalem is, 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 is now under the captivity of these people. So while the Medes and the Persians have taken over the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire now reigns over the Babylonian Empire. They, take, they capture the Jews. They bring them back. They let a few go back. The temple's rebuilt. In, five, in 458, sometime after that, Ezra, if you've read the book of Ezra, you see a story about another great prophet who leads another remnant, another group, a second group of the Jews back to Jerusalem. So now we have another group who's returning home. And then sometime later, about seven years later, Nehemiah goes to the king and he asks permission to return to Jerusalem with a third group to rebuild the walls, the city walls that are around and surround the city. Let me tell you the scenario which this happens, all right? And you'll see those six elements as we go through this whole study of what leadership is and influence and integrity and character, all played out in the life of Nehemiah. Let me just give you a little, little bird's eye view today as we wrap this up today about Nehemiah. Look what's happening. If you open your Bible, you'll see these four verses in Nehemiah as the book begins. The words of Nehemiah, the sons of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Shizliv in the 20th year, this is Nehemiah speaking, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews. They'd been to Jerusalem. He said, well, what about those who had escaped and had survived the captivity? And how's Jerusalem? And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity, they're in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah responds, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. His heart's broken. The people have returned. The, 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 the temple's rebuilt, but it is still vulnerable to enemies. 
the walls and the gates have not been reestablished. If you understand the way that the walls and the cities were protected by walls in those days, you'd understand the importance of defensive, being able to defend those cities against the, the onslaught of the enemies who would come in. And sometimes these battle against these major cities that had the walls around them, they could go on for weeks and weeks and weeks and sometimes months. And what would be happening in those months of battle as the city would lay behind the walls in protection, those forces from without would keep pounding away and pounding away until they finally were able to take some portion of the walls. And once the walls were down, the city would be completely laid in ruin. Now the walls are still down. And his brother tells him, when he asks him, how are things in Jerusalem? Well, the temple's up, but the people are defenseless. And because they're defenseless, they're desperate, and they're hopeless, and they're discouraged, and they're defeated. And those words, you know, hung in, 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 in Nehemiah's heart. And he realized this is, a, this is a disgrace that the people of God would be so vulnerable now remember what got them into that place to start with. Through the Old Testament, you see the sin of God's people. And that, that's not any different today. The Bible still makes it very clear. When the righteous are in authority, then the, then the city and the people rejoice. But sin is a reproach to any nation. As much as the world that we live in would like to secularize everything, separate God from culture, God from school, God from government, it doesn't work that way in the real world. God has everything to do with everything. And if God is rejected in the city, in the state, in the nation, and sin becomes rampant, then it says that nation is in trouble. And that nation cannot survive. And this is in the heart of Nehemiah. What is going on? What needs to happen? And in his heart, he knows what needs to happen when the people are living in rubble, when they're defeated, when they're discouraged, when morale is so desperate and so low, when the situation is like that. People need a leader, but they need a righteous leader. Listen to those words again. It, it, this reads like a diary. This is like his journal. He's telling, he said, I was, in, I was in Susa. That was the summer capital, all right? I was in the summer capital when I saw my brother and I asked him, I knew he'd been to Jerusalem. I asked him how things were. And when he told me this, when he told me this, my heart was broken. And he's, he tells a little bit as you go through the story of who he is. It says in the scriptures, as you follow on down to verse 11, he says, I, Nehemiah, was cupbearer to the king. And he starts giving a little bit of his own who he is. Now, he's the king to Artaxerxes. You've seen that name in Scripture. In fact, in Scripture, he's given three different names. Even in history, he's given three different names. There's another one, Hazaras, and that meant notable or venerable father. Another place, he's called Darius in the book of Daniel, the king of the Medes and Persians. And Nehemiah says, I was cupbearer to the king. What's a cupbearer? I mean, what's a cupbearer doing building walls, by the way? That's not his responsibility. It's not, his, it's not on his resume. I build walls. I built lots of walls. I know wall building. That's not part of, you know, his job description. He's the cupbearer. We say, what's a cupbearer? Now, I know a lot of times we think of the cupbearer, you, you know, the guy who come out and taste the wine before the king drinks the wine to make sure it's not poison. All right? That's only a small part. A cupbearer would be more like the prime. He's like the second in command at this point. He's there by the king. He's a counselor. He's a prime minister. He's second in authority. He has a place of rank and position. I mean, he, he, he's like a, a bodyguard, personal security, security agent, and assistant to the king, prime minister, all in one. He's the one whom the king trusts more than anybody else in the land. He's the king, that the king, the person the king looks to and listens to more than anybody else in the land. In fact, he's committed himself and his life to the king so as to even taste the wine before the king drinks it when many people would love to poison the king. The point I want to make here pretty much is this. It, it, this guy has to be absolutely loyal and trustworthy. And on top of this, listen, he's a Jew. This is not his country. This is not his king. But he's responding to what the Lord's told him to respond to and how to respond in this particular situation. And he's been raised now and elevated to a place of being in authority. And isn't it it's always interesting how God puts people who he wants, where he wants, when he wants them there? 
we use that, that little phrase in our church, we're here for such a time as this. Listen, that doesn't mean believers fellowship as a organization. It means you as a part of this body are here where you are in this place, in this locale, in this city, in this state, in this country for times just like now, desperate times, difficult times, times when people are disappointed, times when people are discouraged, times when people are disheartened. That's why we're here. We're here to make the difference. We're here to offer the hope. We're here to offer direction. We're here to offer life. That's, that's, it's not by coincidence any more than where Nehemiah was a coincidence, being number two in authority when he wasn't even Babylonian or Mede or Persian. He's a Jew. You think about this for a moment. He says, it's in the month of Shizlev, and when Hananiah talks to me about his trip from Jerusalem. Remember where he is and to where Jerusalem is, 800 to 1,000 miles. I mean, it's a long way away. It's a long way away. I mean, in those days, you'd have to take about two months on horse or camel and travel across the desert just to get there. But Nehemiah's reaction is found in verse 4 about a land so far away, which he's probably never even been to himself. He's probably born in captivity because of his age. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept, and for some days I mourned, fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Look at those four reactions. He wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed. I mean, to me, I think he's taking this seriously. I think he's hurt for God's people. I think he's embarrassed by the disgrace of the situation they're in. He says, I did this for some days. He didn't do that for one day. You know, I, I really believe there's a, most of you have enough sensitivity to, to, to hear about the things that have been happening culturally. It breaks your heart maybe for a day or two. But this guy, it's, it's been going on. In fact, he's been praying, weeping, fasting, and mourning. But even, you know how long goes by before he approaches the king about this? If you follow the way he writes it, it's four months that go by that he's praying, seeking God's face about what to do about this. He doesn't just jump, oh, I need to go do something. He, he's seeking God's face. In fact, Nehemiah lists about 11 prayers in the whole book. It's probably more than any other book in the Bible. It records 11 prayers in which he's praying, and we'll, we'll cover some of those over the next few weeks. But here's Nehemiah. You think, well, why, you know, why is God choosing Nehemiah? He's a cupbearer. What skill set does he have? You know, what, what's going on here? So why in the world would God choose Nehemiah as a leader? And these are the things we'll be looking at. One, Nehemiah, obviously, from that reaction, is sensitive to the needs around him. God is looking for people who have a sensitivity. Now, we're living in a day and an age when contemporary Christianity doesn't really deal with that much. We're, what we're sensitive to is what our needs are, what we need from God, how God can help me, how God can needs to take care of me, what God can do for me, how God can bless me, how God can help me. I'm having a back problem. It would be nice for God to heal my problem. I mean, I'm, my foot hurts, you know, I've got corns or whatever, whatever it might be. God, God fix my need. This is not what Nehemiah, Nehemiah is experiencing here. He's broken for the needs of others. He's sensitive to the, to the needs that are, that are around him, that are about him, you know. And this is where real leadership is. It becomes sensitive, not about you and your reputation. What people, it's to meet a need and to care about people. And this is, you think about the, 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 the part about this is why should he be worried? They're 800,000, they're 1,000 miles away. Life's good in the summer palace in Susa. I got a good job. I'm making good money. You know, Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, that's a great ministry. He said, you know, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. That's Nehemiah. But not only, it's also dependable. In fact, the king considered him so dependable and so trustworthy and so reliable, he gave him one of the premier positions in all the kingdom. He entrusted his personal security to this man. I mean, this is enormous trust that has been placed in someone. He's been considered faithful over little. And now he's been given an opportunity to be faithful over much. See, how does that work? You know, the Bible tells us that God looks at our life. And there's those areas that I think that we've talked about many times about our time and our talents and our treasures. Are we faithful in those areas of our life? The commitment that God's called us to with our time. You know, some people just have a hard time even getting to church, all right? Or getting to church on time. You can't get to church on time. You're going to be late for the rapture. By seven years, hopefully not. <laughs> it's going to be a bad thing going on there. Yeah. I mean, but that's just a little thing. It is a little thing. 
And it's important to you when you make an appointment with someone and they show up 15, 30 minutes late. Amen? He's faithful in the little things. He's dependable in time, his talents. How many of you have gifts and talents that God's given you and you're just not using them? But you want God to do something big. You want God to do something spectacular. But you won't be faithful in those little things. What about your, your treasures? Yeah, well, I give the Lord something every once in a while. And you won't manage your money. You won't manage your talents. You won't manage your time in a way that brings glory to God. You won't be faithful in those little things. Don't be expected to be made master over much. Jesus said, if I can't trust you with an unrighteous mammon, how are you going to be trusted with the true spiritual riches? That's a pretty bold statement, is it not? What is it saying? It's saying that a lesson of leadership is pretty simple. We need to be dependable. We need to be dependable people. That if I say I'm going to do something, guess what? I'm going to do it. I'm not going to tell you I'll be there and not be there. I'm not going to tell you that I'll take care of it and not take care of it. I'm not going to say I'll call you and not call you. I'm not going to say I'll meet you and not meet you. It sounds like such simple stuff and little stuff, but it's massively important in our life. And it's in your homes, that same thing. I'm not going to tell my kids one thing, then do something else. I'm not going to tell my wife, yeah, we will, but we don't. Or her to tell me, we're going, we should, but we won't. Now, I know this gets a little tight when we talk about these things, but hey, if we want to be the, the difference makers in the culture, then we've got to have some disciplines in our own life. Some things that we consider, this is so important, and this is such a big deal in my life, that I honor the Lord so much in my life that I will honor him with my time, with my talents, with my treasure, because this ain't a little deal. Now, unfortunately, we give our employees, employers is more, more value than we do God many times. Just a little amen would help. Amen. The last thing, I'm glad you're here. I'm sure you're glad to hear that word. Nehemiah was available. You know, he was available. Four months go by, and you know what he's doing that time? He's planning. He's preparing. He, he's getting ready what he's going to say at the right opportunity. He's praying for the right opportunity to get that king who's been so resistant to those walls being built up. Who's going to, how's it going to work? How's he going to convince that guy to do something he's already given a law against doing? He told them when they went back they couldn't rebuild the walls. It ain't going to happen. How's he going to, how's he going to get that command overridden? There's a lot going on here. But it starts with this place of, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, I'm available. And it's always easy for us to point out problems in government and point out problems with political parties and point out problems in our state and point out problems in our nation, and point out problems in our neighbors and point out problems in our own home. But it's another thing to say, God, I want to do something. I'm available to do something. What would you have me do? I want to be a part. I want to be a part of seeing a change. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. I don't want to sit idly by. I want to be available to you in whatever you want from me. Remember, this guy, this, this, this situation needs a leader, you know, but he already has a job. That's why a lot of people, I already got something I'm doing. I'm not even a contractor, but I'll go rebuild the wall. And he was sensible with the Lord, and he was dependable with the Lord, and he was available. You know, it's, it really, you know, we talk about abilities and leaders. I think that we've talked about, well, it's not God, it's not your ability, it's your availability. But I think it goes farther than that. It's not just your your, your availability, it's your credibility. And it's your dependability as well as your availability. It will be credible. You say, oh, Brother Joe, I, I don't have certain, you know, I, I, I don't have that kind of intellect to do that kind of thing. That doesn't matter to God. Excuse me, let me say it again. Well, I'm not, I'm not educated. I don't have that kind of, that kind of understanding. I, 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 it doesn't matter to God. What matters? Are you credible? Are you dependable? Are you growing in character? Do you care about people? Do you see the needs around you? And if God can rely on you and you're dependable, hey, God's getting ready to do something to you. And something needs to be done. <laughs> Nothing happens until someone provides real leadership for it. Everything rises and falls on that. I listen to a lot of TV over the weekend because of my interest in what's going on with our nation, perusing from channel to channel, getting different perspectives of different agents and different people. And, you know, so many people with answers that are not answers. I listen to a group of sociologists, psychologists, uh, 
interfaith ministries where we get, you know, the Jews, the Muslims, the Christians all together and listen to all those, you know, talking heads. But nobody brought up the real issues. The men's heart are desperately wicked. And only God can change a heart. If you're here today and you have a racist bone in you, that's because you got a heart dirty. Amen? You got a dirty heart. You got a heart that's filled with murder. You got a dirty heart. You got a heart that you think you're better than everybody else. You got a dirty heart. You, and that's your problem. It's a heart problem. Until our heart changes, none of us will ever change. And I think for too long we, we've realized that on some level. We say, well, we just need to educate people more. Well, you can't educate a dirty heart clean. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. The grace of God. And that's why we pray. And that's why we preach. And that's why we live for Jesus. And that's why we share our faith because that's what makes the difference in a nation. And that's what's made America great at one time and can make it great again when Christians decide, hey, we are the salt of this nation. God placed us here and we're the light of this world. We need to be what God's called us to be. That's leadership. If you'll stick with me for five or six weeks, we'll dig a little bit more into this and get a lot more deeper into the actual book of Nehemiah and how God used this man and how he dealt with all the kind of things that you and I deal with every day and find out the right way to deal with it. Let's stand together.